Mount Pleasant, the Falkland Islands. Military aircraft do not land gracefully. They drop from the sky towards the unsuspecting ground. I ran my tongue around my teeth after we slammed down. I could swear some of them had been knocked into my skull. I left the plane and was greeted by the cool, salty air. Damp moorland cover the landscape for as far as the eye could see. I closed my eyes for a moment and inhaled deeply, taking it all in. I couldn't wait. I was at the edge of the world, on my way to board a decent-sized boat and sail some of the wildest waters on Earth, and I felt like I'd just been giving my first case all over again. I looked around to see if anyone was there to meet me. He was waiting for me outside. For a moment, I thought my husband was right, and there were actually bears in the Antarctic. Just grizzlies, not polar bears. Rado, we patted each other on the shoulder and shook forearms firmly. How's it going, kid? Do you want to go straight to the yacht, or do you fancy some penguin watching? I'm a little tired. It was a long flight. Here, eat this. I made you a sandwich with everything I could find. I'll take you straight to the yacht. You can sleep in the car. He turned around and started walking toward a white pickup. See the yacht. The Road to Stanley. I woke up suddenly and saw low grass covered hills rolling past me. You know, it's uncanny, Rado said. This ability of yours to fall asleep in 30 seconds? How do you do it? I shrugged. No idea. And it only works when I sail. I have terrible bouts of insomnia when I'm in London. Two churches, a post office, a police station, and a school. Stanley was not a big town. Look around. I left the car and looked around. To my right was a small building with a sign reading East Jetty Company. Those guys pick up the Zimbabwean minesweepers every morning and drop them at the minefields. What? You didn't know? There were almost 200,000 mines left after the war. Penguins are too light to set them off, but humans, Rado shrugged, humans are dumb. I went to the yacht old friends. The yacht was beautiful. Its sleek, well-built hull was painted a stunning vermilion that could be seen from miles away. Its tall masts and huge, solid winches looked like they were ready for everything nature could throw at them. Five other people were already on board, and the other two were joining us in Ushuaia. The first person I bumped into was Chris. Typical, he said. I've just made myself the perfect cup of coffee, and you appear. I should have known. I gave him a hug. Good to see you too, you grumpy old bugger, I said. He pushed the cup of coffee into my hands. Bow cabin. Dibs on the lower bunk. I wasn't tired. But once I'd climbed into my bunk and unrolled the sleeping bag, I decided to close my eyes for a moment. The dreams came. Just a peaceful night's sleep. The last day on shore. The morning on the yacht was crisp. These temperatures would take some getting used to. I thought about work. I reached for the folder and started going through the files. Put that down this instant, Chris pointed his finger at me, or I'll toss it into the sea the minute we set sail. I decided to go for a walk instead. Grab me a prepaid SIM card, Rado shouted after me and don't stay out too long. There was a sea lion at the end of our pier. Here, kitty, kitty. I tried to get its attention. It ignored me and started scratching behind its ear with its hind flipper, kind of like a cat. Souvenirs. The souvenir store was next to the local restaurant Come hotel, come internet cafe. Look around, dear, said a friendly old lady from behind the counter. Take your time, 
added another sweet old lady, sitting with her tea in the armchair by the window. One of the postcards read, Keep calm and keep the Falklands British. The ladies watched me with warm, benevolent smiles. I bought a postcard and stamps. Bragging to friends back home, are we, dear? The lady gave me a knowing look over her glasses as she packed the postcard. Just letting my dad know where in the world I am. I didn't elaborate on the game dad and I had been playing for years. There were a few hundred houses scattering across the incline overlooking the bay. It wasn't much, but there was a swimming pool with a free shower that I'd definitely use later that evening. Shopping. It was the same as any British supermarket. I bought a SIM card for Rado and another for myself so I could WhatsApp my husband before I disappeared for five weeks. I wondered briefly how he'd manage here without his Netflix, and then I asked myself the same question. How would I manage without my Netflix? Would I go through every book in the world? I used to take at least four of them on each trip. Now I just had my Kindle and some power banks. The only cars I saw on the street were Land Rover Defenders. My favorites. I wish they hadn't stopped making them. Go for a walk. Walk by the sea. I met a huge black cat who decided to keep me company. There was one main street, some houses, a very typical British monument, and a church. I felt like I was in a small town somewhere on the British coast. I continued walking. I walked with the spring in my step, the black cat following me curiously. We heard a fun fact. The Stanley police once employed the only convict they had to answer phones and fill in forms because he was sitting around the police station in any case. At least that's what the lady in the museum told Chris. I went back to the yacht. On board, Stanley Jetty. It was raining cats and dogs all day, but the engine started without any trouble and everyone was up on deck, making jokes about taking photos. Chris, my cabin mate, and the other person on my watch emerged from under the desk with the thermos full of coffee. First, we needed to head south towards Isla de los Estados and later through Le Mer Strait. From Ushuaia, we planned to go around Cape Horn and south to Antarctica and the Le Mer Channel. On the way back, we wanted to go around King George Island and finally back to Ushuaia. At least, that was the plan. It would take us five weeks to sail there and back to Ushuaia. Five weeks of splendid isolation. I can't wait till we have the full crew. I brought Rado some coffee in his favorite mug and then leaned against the railing. What do you think will hit them first? Seasickness or FOMO, he asked. Why so sarcastic? Since when did you get so sarcastic? Since the last crew consisted of three high-maintenance divas. Aren't you a little prejudiced, then? Better safe than sorry, he said solemnly, then grinned. Setting sail. Our passports were stamped, all our documents were signed, and the tanks had been filled with 320 gallons of fuel and 1.5 tons of water. We were ready. Go make them work a bit. Let's test their spe team spirit. I want to see how they handle taking orders from a pixie. From a what? I raised my eyebrow. I could see Rado's shoulders gently lumping up and down as he tried not to contain his laughter. Face it bravely. A giant. You are not. At sea. We hauled in the loose mooring lines and on the stern spring we turned away from the jetty. There were no newbies on the strip, and the whole operation was smooth and quick. Rado was in the cockpit, navigating the strait that would lead us into the open ocean. I smiled, content. We were all on board, excited, talking, taking pictures. Soon we'd be underway, and the routine of watches would replace the chaos. I sipped my coffee and watched the sea. With the mainsail and jib up, 
We turn the engine off. Silence. Just the wind in the ropes, the water slapping the hull, and our hushed conversations. Barren islands disappeared behind us. It was time to start on my watch. A sudden jolt of the boat threw me against the wall. I cursed under my breath and then started to put on layer after layer. My life jacket was the last thing to go on, but as always it felt odd, like I was putting a corset over a raincoat. I went on deck. I crawled outside. The first night, the boat was picking up speed, restless, listing to port. The wind was stronger, the swell was starting to build, and the waves were crashing against the bow in a hypnotic rhythm. Gust after gust filled the sails, and the vessel started to pitch and heave in the steeper waves. I could feel the pressure of the wind, its power propelling us forward, the ropes tightening all around me. My breathing seemed to synchronize with the roar of the ocean. I could feel my sea fever waking from its slumber. The night was dark and moonless. I smiled. On the sea again, the watch was four hours, two people, one hour inside to warm up, make a hot beverage, write down the log, one hour outside behind the wheel, hooked to the mast, keeping the course steady. We talked a lot about life, death, and everything in between. At night, you sail blindly, putting your trust in the instruments. With my watch over, I could finally rest. On the open sea, the yacht started rocking harder. I grinned, facing the waves. Everything was going well. Dolphins, I heard from above. I rushed on deck to watch, remembering to clip on in the process. It was our galley watch. Cooking on a rocking boat was a challenge. Not my favorite thing in the world. Time for an evening meal. We served sandwiches and hot soup for the night watch. My least favorite thing? Cleaning the head on a rocking boat. Talk. This part of my watch was over. Now it was time to take the helm. It was pitch black out there, and scanning the sea for dangers seemed like an impossible task. I smiled to myself. I looked at the stars. The first constellation I saw was the Southern Cross. Did you know, I asked Christ, that it graced the northern sky when the Roman Empire flourished, and then slowly moved beyond the horizon? He looked up. The malady see an anchor instead of a cross. I liked that thought. The watch was over, freezing my ass off. Nice weather, brisk, isn't it? The question puffed into the air and hung there. I looked at Chris, considering how to reply. As long as we're on the boat, let's agree to call it brisk. Chris rubbed his hands. So, are you staying up here? I dreamed of the warm cabin. Are you insane? I laughed. I need to get warm. And miss all of the spectacular views. Wuss. It was freezing. The yacht was going six knots. Not bad. Hide from the cold. People were in and out of the galley constantly, and I talked with whoever was there. 
Have you ever tried using a hand-operated toilet dressed in a dozen layers of clothing and stuffed in a minuscule compartment while being violently tossed around the waves? You should try it sometime. I just sat there. A moment of well-deserved rest. I made some snacks and reached for my book. Go to sleep. I took off my boots, trousers, gloves, insulated jacket, and sweater, and hid my sleeping bag in my merino wool underwear. A stronger wave hit the boat, and I woke up for a moment. Steep, rugged mountains loomed ahead of us, menacing and magnetic in equal measure. We looked at the unwelcoming shores, the cliffs, and the narrow mouths of the fjords. We could feel the force of the waves crashing against the helpless rocks. We anchored. Isla de los Estados. I woke up in the morning and put on my merino gear. Socks, thermal underwear, sweatshirt. I once heard that alpaca wool provided better insulation, but there was no way to weave it as finely as merino wool. I went to the gallery and started to prepare breakfast for the rest of the crew. While I was beating the eggs, I thought about Narand knitwear. Every fishing family had its own, distinctive set of cables on the sweaters so they could identify the bodies of the drowned when the sea finally released them to the shore. Old stories from those times, before GPS. Isla de los Estados was not an unwelcoming island. The mountains, tall and sharp, were covered in dry grass, and the waters around the island were known to be treacherous. There used to be a prison there, and then a seal processing factory, but the elements ultimately prevailed. Now there was a military base in Porto Perry, where we were moored. There was no sign of the prison left. I don't know what's more human, Chris turned to me. The fact that there was a prison here in the first place, or that they went to the trouble to demolishing it. Nature always wins. The building couldn't stand the weather, I said. Nature always wins in the end. A dog barked in the distance. It clearly had its doubts. We wanted to see more of the island, so we hiked to a nearby waterfall. It bloomed through the landscape as we approached the gallons upon gallons of cold water crashing down from a vertical slab of rock. I stood there, mesmerized by its raw beauty. It was sublime, just the ocean, the rocks, and a source of pure, chilled fresh water. The southern hemisphere's waterfalls had something surreal about them. We turned to the yacht, made some coffee, ate some of the banana bread Chris had baked, talked for a little bit, and went to sleep. I slept like a child, even though the wind howled in the ropes and tossed the boat around as if it were a toy. Isla de los Cetados, cool morning. In the morning, Chris shook my arm. Do you want to build a snowman? He asked. It was bloody cold outside. Everything, the deck, the sails, the rigging, was covered in either snow or ice. The base's dog barked happily, rolling in the snow. The rising lit everything in a pink and purple hue. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever fucking seen, Chris gasped. Let's build the snowman, I said. We looked at each other and clinked our cups of coffee. Welcome to the Antarctic. The snow was falling faster than we could remove it. We were underway again the next morning. At sea, we sailed from Puerto Perry, leaving the rugged, snow-covered peaks of Isla de los Estados behind. Going west, we were headed toward the infamous Le Mer Strait. My galley watch was beginning. There were strong currents in the strait, pushing the water from north to south and back again. A yacht like ours could easily get caught in one and smashed against the rocky shore. So far, so good. If we ran downwind, we had a fair chance of passing the worst parts with the help of the northern current. Even so, the water and the wind could change at any moment. Joke with Chris. You know, I thought about going to Antarctica once before, said Chris. 
But I got cold feet, he laughed. Matt groaned. Henry, why are you encouraging him? To blow off steam, I said. Lawyers are normally way too serious. The crew were getting hungry. We prepared spaghetti al guio e lio, simple to do and tasty and warming. Cooking, washing up, cleaning, cooking. This part of my watch was over. Now it was time to take the helm. We were sailing at nine knots, the yacht sliding effortlessly across the sea. The wind was blowing against the current, the waves were climbing higher with every minute, and even with the engine on full, we weren't going anywhere. It was a struggle not to be pushed back by the rising seas. The wind was changing. Six hours into the storm. Clip the fuck on. Now. My hand shot up to the jack stay. Christ on a fucking bike, I swore under my breath. My heart was pounding in my chest. I'd never made that mistake before. Why now? I retraced my steps in my mind. I'd gone up on deck after I felt the wind hit. The boat shook and heaved, and then I felt her groan as if she were a living creature. We'd been stuck at the mouth of the Beagle Channel for the past six hours, and now a storm was gathering. I was enjoying every second of it. Chris was already on deck with Fabio and Matt from the previous watch. We reefed the sails and secured them, soaked to the bone by spray and sweat. Rado stayed at the wheel and tried to keep the boat as steady as possible. I looked at the compass. He sighed. Yeah. We're stuck, and we'll be stuck till morning, he said. I made some quilt calculations in my head. Go to sleep, he said. I did what he told me, and got into my sleeping bag. I woke up four hours later. I made some coffee and poked my head into the pilot house. Rado was still at the helm. Clip on, he said automatically. Mind the gap, I answered. We started laughing. Keep her steady, he said, before going down. It's gonna get nastier. Watch for waves coming from the side, and make sure you're clipped on properly. If you need help, yell. Aye aye, Captain, I said, and went on deck. It was pitch black, and the wind made it almost impossible to breathe. The boat climbed the waves and then slammed into their dark, terrifying throws. Wave to starboard, Chris yelled. Three seconds later, as I was still spitting out seawater that had found its way over my sailing jacket, I heard, Wave to port! I fucking love this place, I yelled back. Don't you? Hell yeah, it's the best fucking party in the universe. I should order some pizza and roll a joint. Every thirty minutes, we changed who was at the wheel. Rado says two people are sick as dogs. Can you imagine for two more hours? yelled Chris, somewhere in the middle of the fifth hour. Of course I can. Even though I was tired, I was still able to hold the wheel. The boat's battle with the storm ran through every fiber of my being, as though the hull were my bones and the sail and rigging were my muscles and tendons. I tried to move my shoulders to release the tightness. I heard a hiss and a roar, and I spun to my right. There it was, steeper, faster and coming from an angle I hadn't expected. Chris, hold on, I hollered as the waves slammed into the starboard stern. My legs were swept from under me, and for a second I was in mid-air, clinging onto the wheel for dear life. The boat groaned and rolled violently to port, only to swing back and correct itself, allowing me to regain my footing. I could feel the adrenaline tingling through my whole body, and suddenly I felt like throwing up. I took one deep breath, and then another, and I managed to hold it back, despite all the seawater in my mouth. 
An hour later, I crawled into my sleeping bag and fell asleep. I dreamed of cracking sea lions and sea kittens. The storm raged on, and somehow, we worked our way through it. Twenty-four hours later, we finally sailed into the calm, steady waters of the Beagle Canal. The sun was rising, and the snow on the mountains gleamed like kaleidoscopic disco glitter. The morning was quiet. The sea had calmed, the current had changed, the wind was getting more favorable, and we were on track again. It was time to get the hell out of here. We finally managed to hide between Isla Nuova and relax a bit. We all gathered in the galley for some candy, coffee, and a bit of whiskey. It was time to start my watch. Jib number one went up, second reef in the mainstail, first reef in the mizzen sail, and we were off. Soon the wind slowed to twenty knots and we could shake out the sails. We radioed the Argentinian and Chilean posts to let them know we were there, and we entered the channel, keeping to the northern Argentinian bank. Before I realized it, my watch was over. We passed a penguin colony. They made such funny noises. Go to sleep. Immediately, I went to my bunk. The yacht glided through the night, and I slept deeply. We'd be passing Estacia Harbortern to starboard and Puerto Wildum. Williams to port a little later. Apart from that, the coastline was almost empty. The sound of the engine lulled me to sleep. I was woken with a shake. It was our watch. I could see Ushuaia with its snow-capped mountains and glacial valleys in the background, the port and two marinas opening their arms up to us. We moored. New faces. When we finally moored at the Asfin Mar Marina, I was feeling alive. I'd almost forgotten the storm. Fucking hell, I'm getting reckless, I said. Rado chuckled. No, kid, you're not. I know you. Give you any responsibility, and you're the opposite of reckless. Tell me, his smile broadened. Were you constantly thinking that you had to make sure everyone was safe? I sighed with relief. How did you know? Experience. Besides, that's what firsts are for. Overactive, overachieving, overprotective. The captain can rest when someone likes that's around. I laughed. Yeah, right, and gave him a dig in the arm. I'm taking a taxi to the prefecture to sign the papers. Rado patted me on the shoulder. Find the two newbies and make sure everybody gets there in an hour, okay? I took a deep breath. I stood on deck and breathed the air. It was crystal clear, sunny, and the view was glorious. Seals were playing in the water. I saw rabbits running around in the grass, and there were birds of prey resting on the hull of a beach ship. I sighed and smiled. I was happy. Two men approached the boat, average height. Average build, nondescript fi features, nothing special. And yet, I suddenly felt my good mood disappear. You were supposed to be here two days ago, snapped one of them. What took you so long? I snorted. Your first time at sea, is it? He was clearly pissed. The other one, who stood some distance away, rolled his eyes and shrugged. Get your stuff on board, but don't get too comfy, I said. We need to be in town in 20 minutes. And who are you to tell me what to do? I heard muffled snorts behind me. The crew had piled on deck and was clearly enjoying the show. If you need to know, I'm the first officer, I answered, hoping that would put an end to the farce. I should have known better. He looked at me, incredulous. Bullshit, he said. The first on this ship is Henry Taylor. You don't look like a Henry to me. Go get him, Henry, I heard wi Chris whisper behind my back. I started to laugh. If I had a penny for every time I heard that. Bikes and beer. We went in, out in the evening, first to Tia Elvira for crabs and wine, 
and then Chris, Fabio, and Matt and I decided to stop for a beer in an Irish pub called Dublin. I liked Ushuaia. It looked like a small tourist trap in the mountains. It even had a hard rock cafe and a Triumph showroom. My mom loved Triumphs. I sighed, thinking about her. It was her dream to come to the Antarctic Circle. She was mad about polar expeditions and read me books about Scott Ed and Edmondson before bedtime. I always wished they'd gone together. I never really understood why they couldn't. Neither could my mom. She would roll her eyes and when I asked her why not and said one word, men. The pub was crowded, so we sat at the bar. I ordered a round of pints and we talked about our lives and experiences at sea. Fabio was a journalist from Spain, and Matt used to be a stockbroker in a city, but now ran a driving school in Cornwall. I listened to Fabio. Fabio had an endless supply of antidotes and witty stories, and knew how to tell them. Even so, I was glad I shared my watch with someone who didn't talk all the time. We drank a lot. We drank our beers and decided to find another pub. The night was young.